Good morning. Welcome to St. Augustine First UMC on this Epiphany Sunday, this first Sunday of 2021. Let's worship God together with this well-known praise song that's very fitting for the New Year's and for Epiphany. This morning is Epiphany. Well, Wednesday is Epiphany. On this January 3rd, we do celebrate Epiphany Sunday, though. Epiphany is the last day of Christmas tide, uh, 12 days of Christmas. January 6th is the last day of Christmas time, Christmas tide. 
And uh, it, it's a time where we remember the light of Christ has come into the world. The light of, of Christ has vanquished the darkness. The light of Christ will win. Kingdom of God will come on earth as it is in heaven. And it's also a time when we remember the coming of the Magi. They actually came uh, well after Jesus was born, even though our nativities have them right there. They came a little bit after Jesus was born. And so on the twelfth day of Christmas, we also remember how the Magi followed the light to the Savior. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the story of the Magi uh, from Matthew chapter 2. If you want to turn there with me, I'm going to start by just reading the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2. Hear the word of God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that had they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You know, one thing that's long amazed me about those magi is is how greatly they sacrifice in the present for a future so uncertain. In the journey to Jerusalem from their home in the far east, it would have taken them three years of nonstop travel. And beside the nighttime sky and the words of the prophets foreign to their own culture. These magi had no certain word that they'd find a Messiah king when they arrived in the land of Israel. You know, I wonder how their their wives must have felt about the stargazing habits of these wealthy men. You know, of course, I, I picture a bunch of of old guys out on some hill with a few pricey versions of ancient telescopes you know, really some conspiracy theory theory hobbyist, some hobbyist that told the town tales as big as the nighttime sky itself. You know, at least I, I figure their word was difficult to believe. And I can picture one of the wise guys saying to his, his wife, Honey, this is the one. This is the star that, that will finally guide the way. And, of course, the... The wife rolls her eyes a bit. She's heard that tale before. You said that last time. And the time before. And the time before. (laughs) What makes this time any different? What makes this star any different? That's a question each of those men, however many were on that journey, that's a question each of them had to answer before they finally left the east for that three-year journey west. Because by the time they made it home, if they made it home, six years would have already gone by. And I'm amazed at how greatly they sacrifice in the present for a future so uncertain. 
in Matthew, their story actually begins well after they leave the far east. It's already been three years by the time we meet the Magi, the wise men. They're arriving in Jerusalem when Matthew's story begins. This is just the start of their story once more in, in Matthew chapter 2. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. Now, if you're an innocent bystander in the market of Jerusalem, this has got to be a wild, once-in-a-lifetime event. I mean, the men dress in strange garb. They, they talk with strange accents. They smell of strange food and strange spice. But most of all, they come with this strange question. Where is the child who's been born king of the Jews? And the other strange part is they fully expect everyone in Jerusalem to know exactly what they're talking about. But no one has a clue. In fact, the talk of a child born as king coming from the lips of eastern royals, it strikes revolutionary fear in the hearts of the people. I, I, I wonder some of the questions of the people on the street. Is it war knocking on the door? Will Rome and, and Herod finally be upstage? Was the Messiah really going to bring God's kingdom here and now? See, Matthew paints a rather vivid scene of fear filling the streets and, and Herod anxiously searching for answers. This is verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with him calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people Israel. At this point, in case you didn't notice, Herod still has not met our Magi face to face. He's only heard of their arrival in the city of David. And it's their mere arrival that prompts this great search for the scriptures. Call in the scribes, he says. Bring in all the priests. The pagan Herod is suddenly spiritual. <laughs> and really, Herod gets a ton of light from his search. The priests and scribes give immediate witness to Bethlehem as the place of the coming child king. But does Herod pick up and go to Bethlehem? Does Herod, or any of the scribes and priests for that matter, does he go pay homage to the king of kings and lord of lords? The truth of the story is, is this. Even with all that light, Herod can't seem to tell night from day. This is how the story continues in verse 7. Then Herod secretly, secretly, called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and also pay him homage. There's a reason. There is a reason that Herod calls the Magi to the palace under the secrecy of a, of a dark plot. He, he says he longs to worship, but instead of going himself, he sends the Magi from the far east to make the short trip down to Bethlehem. See the irony of the story is Herod has all the light he needs. God has already made the coming Messiah plain as a Christmas star in the night sky prophesied down to the exact location from even the ancient word of the prophet. But Herod, 
Herod's apparently too busy with his important work to go find the Messiah born King of the Jews for himself. He's too wrapped up in his pursuit of self-gain to see the light and life being born into his dark world. And meanwhile, the Magi from a foreign land sacrifice all their dignity and all their reputation chasing after a God whose people didn't even recognize his coming. And yet the word of the Lord sends the Magi to Bethlehem and they keep following the star. Listen again to verse 9. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped of the place where the child was. When they saw, saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. See, these strange men, strange men from the far east, they seem to know more about the Son of God than the people of God living right next door. See, that's what really catches me in this story. Matthew says the star stopped over the house where Jesus was. Now, if we thought it was foolish for the people of Jerusalem to miss the star, what about the people of Bethlehem? What about Mary and Joseph's neighbor? I mean, it's not like God was keeping anything quiet. There's a flipping star that appears and it starts moving before it stops above the house of Jesus. And no one in Jerusalem, no one in Judea, no one in all Samaria even notices. But I'm actually not done. Because the priests and scribes of Jerusalem literally read the prophecy with their own two eyes and they do nothing about it. How much more light can the light of the world give? And yet these magi who are said to be far from God, they hear the word Bethlehem and they give their entire lives to the uncertain future of whatever dim light God would give them. And when they finally find the poor child Jesus tripping over his first steps, I imagine, when they see God's light has led them to a promised fulfill, Matthew says they are overwhelmed with joy. You know, maybe we hear these words at the start of, of a new year and we see ourselves as neighbors of that holy family. You know, all that light and all that life sitting right in our reach. But we didn't bother to follow the star. And maybe we say, hey, this year's different. Maybe we go next door and knock on that door. Or maybe we see ourselves as the scribes and, and the Pharisees, you know, those who tell the Christmas story to ourselves year after year, but nothing has ever changed. This year's different. Possibly we, we see ourselves as even Herod, so consumed with self-pursuit and getting ahead that we don't even bother paying homage to the King of Kings. Not only is this a new year, but we also need a new grace. But for all these places we might find ourselves, I don't fully see the gospel in any of them, to be honest. The true gospel is that God would come even at all. The true gospel is that God would, would even be among us ready to heal at all. The true gospel is that God would even give light to any of us. And here we, we find in this Magi's tale, we find a story where we can 
either beat ourselves down from all of last year's failed resolutions for all the light we had and yet still managed to snuff out. We can beat ourselves over the head for missing the star so clearly shining in the night sky, for not knocking on the door of life when God came as our neighbor. Or we can simply realize this good news. God came as our neighbor. Isn't that good news? Good news that sets us free. In fact, God not only came as our neighbor, God never left our side. The light still shines to this day, calling all the world to follow from the far east to the far west. And God's life still offers healing waiting for us to open the door that God's already knocking at. Matthew says the whole thing, I think, with exquisite artistry. He says, When the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. May we give our whole lives to that pursuit of God's light and God's life. There's healing there. There's overwhelming joy there. There's true life when we give ourselves to the light that has already come, breaking into our darkness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Last song of Christmas. Go tell it on the mountain. (laughs) Will you sing it with me? Let's follow the star. Give ourselves fully to God. And go scream it from the mountaintops. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hill. Shepherds kept their watching for silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray.